Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for spending the time to joining us uh, for our webinar today. Uh, my name is Philip May. I'm from our Calgary office. Today, I have my colleague Shen Lu from our Vancouver office. Um, today's topic, we are going to cover Canadians working in the U.S. Tax 101, the basics. Um, so before we kick off the, the presentation, I just want to go over some of the housekeeping items. So we encourage the audience to participate in our uh, conversation today. So if you have any questions, feel free to answer it in the Q&A sections. One of our panelists would answer the question or bring it up to us uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, make sure that um, you ask any question. And then after the, the presentation today, um, a survey will be sent to you. Make sure to fill out the survey, let us know how we did this time and then any topic that you're interested for the future. And also you could turn on the live transcript functions uh, for closed captioning, it would show the, the, the closed caption of the presentations. So today's agenda, we are going to cover a few different topics related to Canadians working in the US. So the first one is tax residency. And then the second one is when does US tax would apply? The third one is US payroll taxes. The fourth one is employee versus independent contractor. And then the last one would be the related tax filing requirements. So for the first topic, I would have uh, my colleague Shan to go over some of the tax residency determinations. Thanks, Philip. So when talking about cross-border situations, we always come to tax residency first. This is especially important for Canadians working in the US because residents are taxed on worldwide income, but non-residents are only taxed on income sourced to that country. When looking at Canada and US domestic laws on tax residency, they take a slightly different approach. Canada has a more subjective approach looking at the residential ties you have with the country. And with significant residential ties, you would be a tax resident of Canada. And residential ties can include a home in Canada, a spouse or common law partner, and dependents who stayed in Canada. Other relevant ties might include holding a Canadian driver's license, owning Canadian bank accounts, health insurance, and other social ties in Canada. Canada also has the soldiering rule where uh, the taxpayers do not have significant residential ties, but stayed in Canada for 183 days or more in a calendar year they would become a resident of Canada for tax purposes as well. The U.S., however, takes a more objective approach. An individual would be a U.S. resident alien if they are lawful permanent residents or meet the substantial presence test. Uh, note that for U.S. citizens, you will always get taxed on your worldwide income, no matter where you are. Next slide, please. Uh, so you will be a lawful permanent resident when holding a green card, uh, which means you're a tax resident of the US. Uh, the same thing is true when meeting the substantial presence test, often referred as the 183 days test. It could be staying in the US for over 183 days in the current year, or, for example, if an individual spent 130 days in the U.S. for the past three years, um, they would also meet the substantial presence test in the third year. So when counting the days present in the U.S., it includes a physical presence in the U.S. for any time during a day. And there are a few exceptions available, one of which is for commuters who live in Canada or Mexico and go to work in the US. The days in commuting would not be included in the 183 days test. There are also other exceptions, including medical conditions, etc., which we won't go through the details today. Uh, lastly, if you do not meet the lawful permanent residence, 
and the substantial, uh, substantial presence test. Uh, there is a first year election available to treat you as a tax resident in the US. There are a few criteria um, to make that election, uh, including meeting the substantial presence test for the year after the election year and not being a tax resident in the year prior to the election year. Um, also, you have to stay at least 31 consecutive days in the election year and present in the US for 75% of the time, counting from the first day of that 31 day period to December 31st. And once you make that election, you will be a tax, uh, US tax resident on the first day of the 31 days uh, in a row in the US. So, so Shane, uh, so it seems like the first year election would be applicable for taxpayer that does move to the U.S. more like in the second half of the year. That if they are just looking at the current year, they are not going to meet the substantial presence test. But since they actually move to the U.S., majority of the days or over seventy-five days uh, mm -hmm. after they pre present in the U.S. would be uh, remain in the U.S. And then also for the year after that, they would remain in the U.S on a more regular basis, assuming over like 183 days, then that's kind of what the first year election is available for. Um, so you could kind of establish your residency, uh, your US tax residency in the year of move instead of a later year. That's and also uh, some additional comment related to the substantial presence test is um, it used, it was calculated based on the formula on the day your physical presence in the US. Uh, the formula is equal to one sixth of the two prior years and then one third of the prior years number of days and then plus the current year uh, presence days. If the, the calculation method is, o the, the, the result is over 183, then the taxpayer meets the substantial presence test. Thanks, Philip, for explaining that. Uh, that's why the US is more objective. You're actually calculating the days you stayed in the US. Yeah, because of the objectiveness of the, the test. So it gives some planning opportunity for taxpayer to either stay below the, the 183 days or above the 183 days, which we will discuss in a later sections. Okay. Yes, next slide, please. So for Canadians working in the US, uh, it's actually very common to see that the taxpayer is a resident of both countries under their respective laws. Um, because you, as you see, the two tests are different. One is subjective and one is objective. And in this case, we need to look at the treaty to determine the tax residency. The treaty tiebreaker is a mechanical test that stops if one factor is determinative. And the very first test is where is your permanent home? A home can be a place you purchased or rented and lived in, or it could be a friend's place that you lived in. It could also be a boat or a trailer that you reside. And if you have a permanent home in both or neither countries, then we go to the next test, the center of vital interest. Uh, this is a two-part test, personal and economic. Generally, the personal test is where your spouse or dependents are. If you're not married or not having dependents, your personal center of vital interest become much more unclear to where it is. Note that for dependents, uh, our children that requires you to be present to look after them, uh, not a child, for example, studying in a new university in another country. The second part of the test is economic. This is mostly where do you work? And where does your work require you to be on a regular basis? Because this is a two part test, you have to pass or fail both parts for it to be determinative. And if it's a split, meaning having personal center of vital interests in one country and economic in another, uh, then you're going to the next test because the center of vital interest was not determined. So the next test is habitual abode. 
this is more like a 183 night test. Where did you slip? Uh, if you slip most of your days in Canada, you're probably a Canadian resident. And it's not enough to have a few extra nights in Canada or in the US to be determinative. It has to be clear and compelling. So if the all of the first three tests are not determinative, then you go to the fourth test, citizenship. Uh, you could be a citizen of both countries or neither. Um, in that case, you get to a really an euro and undesirable situation, actually, called competent authority. In this case, the uh, IRS and the CRA will decide where you are a tax resident of. And it takes several years to get an answer for this. So it's really a disaster for from a tax planning perspective. So Shen, if I hear the, the explanation correctly, is um, a taxpayer may not have to go through all the, the five tests in the tie, tiebreaker rules, as long as they come up with a, a determinative answer in the earlier test, mm -hmm. the test basically stop, right? That's right. Okay. Um, and also I got a question on permanent home. Does the, the size of the home or the, the value of the home or even ownership of the home matters? Let's say that I have I own a home in one country and then I, I rented another home in another country. Um, are they both permanent homes uh, for me? That's right. They are both permanent homes. As long as it's available to you, it doesn't matter the size, whether you renovated them or whether you own them, it's, all, it's a home available to you. So it counts it as permanent home under the tiebreaker test. Okay. Yeah. So um, like Shen just mentioned, um, the tiebreaker rule is just be, be applicable when a taxpayer is being considered as a resident of more than one countries, and then um, the tiebreaker rule is used to determine um, the tax residency of the taxpayer. And then next slide, we are going over an example that we come up with. Yes, so we talked a lot about the rules in Canada, in the US, and the treaty that apply them to this example. Uh, we have a taxpayer, A, is employed by US employer. The employer pays lease on a condo in the US. A's spouse and children live in Canada. And A is on duty for, uh, in the US for three weeks in a row and then takes two weeks off to uh, Canada. Where does A reside? In other words, which country A is a tax resident of? Philip, do you want to lay the discussion here? Yeah. So. Um... Whenever we are uh, determining a tax residency of a taxpayer, we would have to always refer it to the domestic law first. So let's look at from the Canadian's perspective. Uh, as Jen has mentioned that Canada is mostly defined its residence based on subjective matters. They look at the residency ties with Canada. So in this case, A has uh, his spouse and children living in Canada. Um, Assuming that he has his home here, his personal properties here, probably most of his financial assets are also located in Canada, it does seem like that A have a significant amount of time with Canada other than that, other than the fact that A works mostly in the US. Um, so, so from a Canadian's perspective, A would likely remain as a Canadian tax resident. Then we move on from the to the US perspective. So the US in contrast, is the test is objective. So assuming A is not a citizen or green card holder to begin with, A would be a, a, a US tax resident if it meets the substantial presence test. So looking at the current year, A would be spending three weeks for every five weeks in the US. So more than 50% of the day of the year would be physically presence in the US. Because a is spending over 183 days in the year in the US. A would be also a US tax resident under the US domestic tax laws. So in this case, A is being considered as both a Canadian tax resident and a US tax resident uh, at the same time. So as discussed just earlier, if that's the case, then we have to refer to the income tax treaty between Canada and US 
for the tiebreaker rule to further determine which country he's really a resident of. So we go through the, the five tasks. The first one is uh, permanent home. A has a permanent home likely in, in Canada where his spouse and children in stays. And also A has a condo available for his use in the US. Uh, like we just have talked about, um, the fact that the employer pays the list and on a condo in the US that may be smaller than it's cheaper than, than the home in, in Canada, it does not change the fact that it's a permanent home available for A's use. So regarding the permanent home test, it would be a tie and not determinative. Then we move on to the next test, which is the habitual uh, center of vital interest. Um, as mentioned, there are two perspectives to the vital of interest. One is personal, the other one is economic. For A's case, his personal interest mostly stays with Canada because his spouse here, his dependent child uh, stays in Canada. On the other hand, A's economic interest it would be in the US, where he, the location where he performed his employment service. So again, for the center of vital interest, there was not determinative. Um, then we move on to the next test, which is the habitual abode. For this case, A actually gonna spend about three weeks for every five weeks during the year in the US. So he's physically in the US about 210 days while 140 days in Canada. The significance, uh, the difference between the two, them, two nights are significant enough. So under the habitual abode, A would likely um, have a closer tie to, to the US. And under the tiebreaker uh, test, A would be considered as a US tax resident instead of a Canadian tax resident. So, so that, that's the, the likely conclusion based on all the facts that we have. Uh, when, when we're dealing with the taxpayer in this situation, A may, may think that it's a surprise that he actually changed residency while he's only working in the US and maybe try to avoid the situation. But on the other hand, it could be actually a tax preferential um, situation that A ends up with. So for example, if A uh, lives in British Columbia and then working in Washington state, for every $200,000 of income, A is gonna be expected to pay about $65,000 tax to British Columbia while only paying $36,000 to Washington, uh, to US federal and there was no state tax in Washington state. So we are talking about a difference of tax saving of about $29,000 by, by remaining as a US tax resident. Um, a would have to think about the Canadian departure tax, which he has way to defer it. But again, that would be um, the cost of deferring the departure tax would be insignificant comparing to the annual tax saving of $29,000. So in this case, A should really consider all the tax implication and make the decision on, on adapting his lifestyle to make sure he get the, uh, more desirable tax results. So Philip, in this case, a citizenship doesn't matter, right? Uh, it, it depends. If A happened to be a US citizen, then all the discussion here somewhat not applicable as much. Um, as a US citizen, A would be automatically treat, treated as a US resident, uh, no matter how. Um, so we don't necessarily have to rely on the tiebreaker rule to determine A's tax residency. What happened would be A would likely remain as a, U, a Canadian resident, or, or actually A could potentially using the tiebreaker rule to depart Canada, actually, um, while A's being a US citizen, then he would be a US resident uh, for all the time. And then if A is a, only a Canadian citizen and not a US citizen, then that doesn't apply because the tiebreaker rule, we never get to the citizenship test. We, we come up with the determinative answer uh, in the habitual abode test, and then the citizenship doesn't apply. So next one, uh, after we discuss tax residency, we try to introduce another concept of a uh, source of income. So why source of income is important is in the case of a non-resident alien of the US, 
only U.S. source income is subject to U.S. taxation. So we would have to decide what exactly is U.S. source income. So the sourcing of income have different rules depending on different types of income. So here we're mostly focusing on employment or business income. Um, the sourcing of employment and business income is depending on the location where service is performed, not where the payer is located, not based on the currency of payment. So assuming that you work remotely in Canada uh, for a U.S. employer getting paid U.S. dollar, all those income would be still considered as Canadian source income and should not be subject to U.S. taxation. Uh, on the other hand, if you are working for a Canadian employer but physically performing in the U.S., they are U.S. source income. And then whenever a taxpayer have U.S. source income, then we would have to determine whether U.S. tax, federal tax would be applicable. Uh, it depends on a few factors. The first one is like what we have discussed for the first part of our presentation, depending on whether the employee is a U.S. tax resident or not. Uh, in case that the employee is a U.S. tax resident, their worldwide income would be subject to U.S. tax. So it doesn't really matter whether it's Canadian source, U.S. source. Um, assuming that the employee is not a tax resident of the U.S., then we would want to see if the employee could qualify for the certain exception that is outlined in the income tax treaty. Um, in one of the article related to employment income, one of, the, uh, one of the criteria for the income to be excluded from U.S. taxation is either the total U.S. source income is under $10,000 or the employee's uh, physical days in the U.S. is less than 183 days over any rolling 12 months. And then the employer does not have a U.S. permanent establishment uh, in the U.S. If that's the case, then even the employee have U.S. source income, it could be excluded from U.S. taxations. So we, we list out a few different possible outcomes. So the first one is, if the employee is a U.S. tax or resident, there would be U.S. federal tax on worldwide income, regardless of where the income coming from, or regardless of what type of income. Uh, you essentially being treated as a U.S. person for U.S. tax, and then you are subject to the same uh, taxation, and then also reporting requirement as a U.S domestic residents. And then the second outcome is there could be only U.S. federal tax on U.S. source income. That would be the case that the employee is not a U.S. tax resident. And then the U.S. source income could not be excluded under the income tax treaty. Uh, either that they are working for a U.S. employer or they spending over 183 days in the U.S. during the years, during the, any ro ro rolling 12 months. So that's the, the outcome. And then the last outcome would be there was no U.S. federal tax at all. That situation is applicable when the employee is not a U.S. tax resident. And then the U.S. source income could be excluded under the treaty, or even the employee doesn't even have any U.S. source income. So that's the, the three possible outcomes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is even there was, regardless how, federal tax on the income, the state may still tax the employment income uh, if they meet certain criteria. For example, California doesn't, doesn't follow the income tax treaty. So in case you're working in California, even just for one day, uh, you might be still subject to California state tax. So Philip, you talked about uh, the employee's situation here. Is there a difference for independent contractors? For independent contractor, we would still have to uh, decide depending on the tax residency. Again, if they become a U.S. tax resident, their worldwide income is still subject to U.S. taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, if they didn't become a, a U.S. tax resident, then they would have to see whether their income is U.S. source and then if they are U.S. source, then we would have to rely on a different article in the treaty to see whether they could be excluded uh, based on the treaty benefit. The, the criteria is slightly different comparing to an employment income. Uh, in that case, the independent contractor have to review to see whether himself have a permanent establishment in the U.S. So that's a slightly different test. And since we have talked about so much about permanent establishment, um, 
we, we will want to discuss it further. So, so permanent establishment is a, a fixed place of business. You could think about it as an office, uh, a factory, um, and a place for business. Right now, I think the, after the, the pandemic, there was the office setting is not as um, normal as before. A lot of a, a lot of the employment could be performed from home. But in case you have employee that is doing sales work and concluding contract uh, for you, that might be able to high enough to create a permanent establishment for the for the employer as well. Uh, it's defined in the Canada U.S. Tax Treaty. It lists out all different um, criteria on what, when certain activity is enough to create a permanent establishment. So like I just have talked about, even being an employee performing certain activity in the U.S. could potentially creating a permanent establishment. Uh, so if they are selling uh, concluding contracts, they might creating a permanent establishment for their employer, actually. So when the employer, assuming a non-U.S. entity that have a permanent establishment in the U.S., they would be subject to U.S. corporate tax. They are uh, liable for withholding U.S. payroll tax. And also because the employees working, the providing employment service tying to a, a U.S. permanent establishment, the employment income may be subject to U.S. taxation as well. So that's key to determine the permanent establishment status for both the employer level and also the independent contractor level. So the next one, we are going to cover a little bit about the U.S. payroll tax. Um, similar for, for Canadian and payroll tax, uh, whenever a, a taxpayers earning employment income from the US, the employer should report the report the employment income on IRS form W2, similar to the Canadian form T4. Uh, and then the employer is liable of withholding income tax, social security tax, Medicare tax. Uh, and under certain circumstance, additional Medicare tax would be applicable. And then the employer is also liable for paying the federal unemployment tax. So the employer actually subject to a wide variety of withholding obligations. So Philip, are independent contractors subject to the same payroll tax? No. So independent contractors are similar to Canada. They are kind of liable to pay their own tax. So the payor of the, the income just have to report the, the the business income on a slip that is issued to the independent contractor is up to the independent contractor's obligation to remit the tax um, and then pay the tax. So the, the payer is not liable of doing any, any of the withholding, assuming that the independent contractor has provided the proper disclosure uh, to the payer stating that the income would be effectively connected. So because of the withholding tax, the employee could potentially run into a few different problems. So we'll list out the two common problems that are um, facing by US uh, for Canadian employee that actually working in the US. The first one is cash flow problems. So for example, for a Canadian that travel to the US and, and perform work in the US, uh, assuming that the employment income related to those those employment days in, in the US is taxable. Um, they would be subject to US taxation on the, on the income. And then typically for a Canadian entity or non-US entity, they are not registered with the IRS. They are not able to withhold US income tax and remit it to the IRS. So what happens when the, the employee file is returned uh, after the end, he would owe tax to the US while on the Canadian tax return, because he could claim foreign tax credit for on his US source income, he would expect a huge refund uh, from, from the CRA. So you could see that there was a cash flow problem that you have to pay US tax, but have to ref try to get a tax refund from Canada. Couple solution to this problem is um, there was a way for apply for CRA for reduction on withholding tax, um, stating that the taxpayer is expecting uh, to claim certain amount of foreign tax credit. So the employer is not going to withhold that much tax. And then the employee is going to use some of those 
uh, reduction to remit U.S. tax. So they could remit it by installing. Um, so by the time they file the U.S. tax return, the tax tax owing or payable is not going to be as large as as before. So this is the first problem. The second one is um, it's rather a problem. It's more like a, a planning opportunity. So for U.S. Social Security tax and Medicare tax, it is much higher comparing to Canada pension plan. So um, on, for example, on a $200,000 income, the, the Medicare tax and additional Medicare tax and Social Security tax could be up to $16,500. So, so comparing to Canada pension plan, the, the maximum uh, premium is about $3,500. So we are talking about a $13,000 difference for stating under the Canadian social security system versus the US social security system. So for some of the employee that is working in, in the US on a temporary assignment basis, there was way for them to stay on the Canadian CPP plan instead of move over to the social security systems. So the employer need to apply for the certificate of coverage. Once approved, they are exempted from being withheld the social security tax and Medicare tax and remain on the CPP. Um, the certificate of coverage typically lasts for five years and they could be potentially renewed if the, the, if the employee is working on the new assignments. So that's the, the US payroll tax implications. Uh, the next slides, we are going to talk about the distinguishment between employees and independent contractors. Thanks, Philip. So I asked a few questions about the different tax laws actually applying to employees versus independent contractors. So how should you classify between the two? There are actually a lot of court cases around this area with many facts considering in deciding whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. At least relevant facts fall into three main categories, uh, behavior control, financial control, and relationship of the parties. Uh, in each case, it's very important to consider all the facts there is no single fact that provides the answer. For behavior control, uh, we ask the question, does the company control or have the right to control what the worker does and how the worker does the job? If you receive extensive instructions on how work is to be done, this suggests that you are an employee. And instructions can cover a wide range of topics, for example, how, when, and where to do the work, what tools or equipment to use, uh, where to purchase supplies and services. And if you receive instructions about what should be done but not how it should be done, you may be an independent contractor. For financial control, uh, are the business aspects of the worker's job controlled by the payer? Things like how the worker is paid, are expense reimbursed, and who provides tools or supplies? And lastly, for relationship of the parties, we should consider um, whether there are writing contracts or employee tap benefits, and does the relationship have uh, continuity? Next slide, please. Uh, so we have listed the common factors here to consider when evaluating the status of a worker. Uh, this list is not comprehensive and all relevant facts should be considered. We talked about the extensive instructions already. For training, if the business provides you with the training about required procedures and methods, this indicates that the business wants the work done in a certain way and suggests that you may be an employee. This, uh, the next three factors are related to the financial aspect. If you have a significant investment in your work, you may be an independent contractor. There is no precise dollar amount, but the investment must have substance. 
also a uh, significant investment is not necessary to be an independent contractor uh, if you are not reimbursed uh, for some or all uh, business expenses uh, then you may be an independent contractor especially if the unreimbursed portion are high and also uh, if you can realize a profit or incur a loss this suggests that you are in the business for yourself and that you may be an independent contractor and as for the relationship category if you receive employee benefits um, such as insurance pension or paid leave this is an indication that you may be an employee and if you do not receive this benefits however you could be an, either an employee or an independent contractor uh, lastly written contract may show what both you and the business intend um, this may only be significant if it's really difficult are not possible to determine the status based on the other facts. So it seems like there are a lot of different factors to be considered when making the determination between employee and independent contractor. So what happens if certain factors have a, a argument or a factor that is closer to an employee while the other factors is, um, comes back with a conclusion more to, leaning towards the independent contractor. How are we dealing with the conflict conclusions? Yeah, this is not an easy determination in some cases. Um, so when you're looking at the status of a worker, we really need to collect all the facts around the behavior control, the financial control, and the relationship of the parties. And you're correct, Philip, there are facts that suggesting you're an employee, but other facts suggesting you're an independent contractor. Uh, so the conclusion is really needs to be based on substance. And in, in certain cases that you really cannot outweigh one side over another, um, firms and workers can actually reach out to IRS and file a form called SS8 to request loan to determine the worker's status as an employee or independent contractor. Okay, so so yeah, and another comment related to this is, uh, even though our discussion is mostly focused on the U.S. tax uh, purpose, a lot of those factors is actually similar for Canadian tax purpose as well. They do share similar factors that they have actually look at. So a lot of the case, or most of the case that you would likely reach the same conclusion between Canada and US about the employee versus the independent contractor status. Uh, another thing to consider is also uh, when employee and independent contractor may have some impact on the, the employee or the individual's um, tax implications, it could also impact the entity's um, taxing implications. So like we just have mentioned before about a permanent establishment. So if the entity hires someone to do some sales work in a foreign country in the US, uh, if the individual is considered as an employee, that employee likely is already creating uh, a permanent establishment for the entity. And then the entity would be subject to US corporate tax uh, and is considered carrying on a business for a US branch, et cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, if the sales person is considered as an independent contractor, that activity doesn't necessarily create a permanent establishment for the US entity. So for knowing the, the different implication and benefit and, and cons with the different classification, there may be some um, planning opportunity available, either leaning towards employee versus independent contractor, uh, when the contract was set up, when the employment was originally set up. Um, So with these factors in mind, let's do a quiz on whether the worker is an employee or an independent contractor. Okay, the first one is uh, a vice president of the company. So, so for a vice president of the company, likely that they um, 
the behavioral is pretty controlled by the corporation. They're expected to do, perform certain set of uh, employment uh, service. And then their financial control is relatively low. They get paid on a fixed salary. They are not burdening. Um, there, there was not any financial burdens on potential loss or other business expense. Um, so typically a vice president of the company is an employee, but under certain life circumstance, the vice president could be a independent contractor as well. It goes back to that discussion, how, how tough to actually make that determination. It really based on the other facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say in you know, a rare situation, if the if an officer of the corporation does not perform service or perform only minimum service, then he shouldn't receive the wages that is considered to be an employee. So might be leaning towards the independent contractor side. Uh, what about a former employee with the same responsibilities? Yeah, so a former employee with the same responsibility, this one is kind of interesting. Um, we, we, we are not questioning why the intention of stopping the employment contract, but carry on the same responsibility. But the fact that the employee is performing the same responsibility, if it actually um, subject to the same behavioral control, and then the only change may be the financial, how it got paid, that might not be enough for the employee to be considered as an independent contractor, uh, because it's again going back to those um, those factors. He still got uh, a, a good instruction on how to perform the service. The company is likely still performing service, uh, performing tra uh, training to the employees. Um, the way that he get paid in a in a lump sum instead of on a payroll or subject to withholding tax. That's that only change is not enough to move him over from employment to independent contractor. Yeah, totally agree there. Um, and another thing to consider would be uh, employee benefits, whether he received paid leave. Is, if it's all the same thing, um, whether you're on a contract or not really doesn't matter. Yes. So the next one is uh, a company's lawyer. For this one, there might be facts suggesting an employee or an independent contractor. And one of the critical factor is actually the existence of more than one client. So if the lawyer only works for this company, it might suggest that he might be an employee. Um, but if the lawyer has held himself out to the public to provide the service, it's, it's probably more likely to be an independent contractor. Uh, also, we would also consider the other factors that Philip previously mentioned, uh, whether the firm provides trainings um, to the lawyer and whether controls the lawyer's um, behavior. And also, if the lawyer bears the economic risk of profit or loss, um, whether there is continuing relationship, and also the use of personal equipment might be another factor as well. So there are really a lot of facts you want to gather to make uh, a determination uh, between employee and the independent contractor. Yeah, and another factor to consider maybe if the lawyer, um, does he hire, um, his own employee to help him perform the service and then whether that portion of the cost was spared by the company or he bear by himself uh, that would be a good indication um, and then I could cover the last one as well the IT consultant is actually a lot of the the determination is similar to the to the lawyer whether the consultant have another business that they do serve other clients um, do they bear the financial risk of losing money from the business do they have another employee working for them and then whether their behavior was controlled by the by the organization uh, whether they are receiving like employee benefit etc uh, a lot of those factors is kind of similar to a lawyer uh, again it, it would be depending on a lot of the facts that was not available here but it kind of provides you a, a kind of general direction on how you want to determine an employee versus independent contractors. So the next slide is 
uh, we are just going to talk about a little bit about the US tax filing requirements after we have addressed about where we as status about US resident, non-resident, employee, independent contractor, and whether the US source income is uh, excludable under the treaty. Um, so a US tax return may be required when a non-resident alien that has US source income. Uh, and then also it could apply when the taxpayer becomes a, a resident alien of the US. Uh, under those two scenarios, they actually file different tax returns. Um, when the taxpayer is a non-resident alien of the US and has US source income, they are going to file IRS form 1040NR, the NR suggesting non-resident alien. Uh, and then for when the taxpayer become a resident alien of the US, they are going to file IRS Form 1040, reporting their worldwide income and also areas of informational disclosure that is required for any US tax per, uh, US persons. Um, there are there are a few things that we want to want to address. Uh, in the case that the US source income is excluded from US taxation based on the treaty. Um, a treaty disclosure is to re is required. So what happened? It could be um, the taxpayer travel to the U.S., work a few days, making about five thousand uh, dollar. That is from the U.S. Even there was no tax owing on it, the taxpayer still required to file the treaty disclosure to the IRS, stating the article that they're relying on on the reasoning that why the income is not subject to U.S. taxation. Uh, if the treaty disclosure and the form 1040-NI is not filed, they could be penalized or the treaty benefit could be denied by the IRS. And also the se second scenario is disclosure sometimes could be still applicable when the taxpayer spent 183 days in the U.S. Philip, could you explain more about the disclosure? What kind of disclosures are required and in what situations you would not be a resident if you stayed over? 183 days in the US. Okay, uh, so going back to it, kind of link it to the whole presentation we just did. So, when a taxpayer spent over 183 days uh, in the US during any particular tax year, he or she would be a, a US tax resident based on substantial presence tax. Um, in this case, we assume that he could rely on the treaty tiebreaker rule to be a non-resident of the US and remain as a resident of Canada in, in our case, um, he would need to file the treaty disclosure to disclose that treaty position, similar as the, the exclusion of wage or employment income. But uh, in addition to that, he would also be treated as a US person for a variety of disclosure requirements. Uh, some, some example, including the foreign bank account report, um, the ownership of a control foreign corporations, um, and then also the owner of a foreign grantor, a non grantor trust. So even though the taxpayer is not subject to US taxation, he or she still considers a US person for a lot of uh, different filing purpose. And most of those disclosure form carries a significant amount of penalty usually starting from $10,000 adjusted for inflation for every form. So as you can imagine that once a taxpayer spent over 183 days in the US, even if it does not subject to any US tax, the, the compliance requirement is rather complex. And then the, the consequence of not being compliant could be significant uh, due to the various of penalties, or there may be the risk of IRS denying the treaty uh, benefit. So we always advise our client to, to track the physical days in the US really closely. Once they are over 183 days, then we have to think about like all the di different disclosure that is applicable. So this that's it for our presentation today. Um, we will be opening up for question for right now. And now I wa want to also remind everyone to please complete the survey that going to send out to you lately, uh, sh shortly, and then uh, tell us how we can approve and then topics you would like us to, to cover. So right now, let's open up the, the question. Uh, one of our panelists will ask the question they collected from the, the Q&A sections. Thank you, Philip, Shen, uh, for the presentation.
thank you for the audience participation. We received quite a few questions, and uh, I think most of questions really focus on the residency determination. So um, we have a few situations. They might be similar, but but due to the constraints, I guess people have to type the questions in the Q and A panel. So the facts may not be uh, uh, enough for the determination. So the first one, the first situation is, um, what if I have a home in the US and also have another home in Canada, which is rented, and all my family lives with me in the US, how to determine the tax residency? So uh, it kind of goes back to the, the, the follow the step of de determining tax residency is we always refer it to the domestic tax law first. Um, so based on the assumption that the taxpayer standing significant amount of time in the US with the family, um, I would assume he he's passed the substantial present test and would be a US tax resident under domestic law. Uh, the, the question now becomes if he still remain uh, has enough residency tied with Canada. Uh, I don't know, other than the rental home, whether he would have, say, a business in Canada, maybe other families in Canada, maybe financial assets. Uh, does he work in Canada, etc.? cetera? Um, if, hypothetically speaking, let, let's assume that he still have quite a bit of um, connection with Canada, that he would still remain as a Canadian tax resident based on maybe he still have personal property in Canada, has financial assets in Canada, still have healthcare, maybe, um, et cetera, or maybe even work in Canada. Then we would have to go to the treaty tiebreaker test. The first test is called permanent home. So in for that test, we will look at whether the taxpayer have a permanent home available for his use in Canada and US. For, for US, it's pretty obvious that it's yes, he has a home there. For Canada, because he has rented out the home, presumably on a longer term basis, like maybe a one year lease, two year lease, um, he doesn't really have a permanent home available for his use in Canada. So for that task, he would be tie break to the U.S. And, and remain as a U.S. tax resident and a non-resident for Canada. So like, like Lee had mentioned, we don't have all the facts, but that's just the general uh, flow of making determination regarding tax residency. Thank you, Philip. The next question, um, we do have a few, few clients asking questions about two spouses uh, working in uh, US and Canada during the year. So this situation is, what if wife stays mostly in, U in the US and I as a Canadian permanent resident stays mostly in Canada, but I have both US and Canadian permanent resident, re resident status. Um, so this is basically the facts. So again, um, going back to the basic, we would have to rely on the US and Canadian domestic law to determine whether you are a tax resident under the domestic law settings. Um, I think you mentioned that he's a permanent a permanent resident of both Canada and US. Yes. So he, he since he holds a green card, he would be automatically considered as a US tax resident unless he claims certain exception that is not uh, is beyond the scope of this presentation. Let's assume that's the case, then he would be a US tax resident because of his green card. And then he stay most of the year in, in Canada, and then he's working in Canada. So likely he would have enough residency tie with Canada to be a Canadian resident under the domestic law settings. Uh, in this case, because of that, he would have to rely on the treaty again to, to make the determination on about which country he's really a resident of. Um, again, we, we go for the permanent home, assuming he has both. Uh, he has home in both country. And then the, the next one would be center of vital interest. And his economic interest would be in Canada while his personal would be in the US because his wife living in the US. Uh, the next one would be habitual abode. 
So if he's staying most of the year in Canada, he would be a Canadian resident based on the treaty. Uh, the, the same logic could be applied to his wife um, because she stayed mostly in the U.S. She would likely be a U.S. tax resident. So this would be some, one of the more uh, uncommon situation that um, the married couple have different tax residencies. Uh, it could happen for tax purpose, but it's uh, it really depending on the facts. Also, I would like to mention that for when you're determining the Canadian tax residency, having a Canadian PR doesn't affect anything. It's really the residential ties you have with the Canada, whether you are a citizen or PR or just a visitor, um, it could apply for tax residents. Thank you both for the answer. Uh, the next situation is, uh, what happens if my wife and I move to the U.S. from Canada because I will be working for a U.S. company, but she wants to continue to work remotely for her current Canadian uh, employer? How will she pay taxes? Okay, uh, so in this case, um, we're already taking the assumption that the whole family is going to move to, to the U.S., uh, I'm currently expecting that they would establish the U.S. residency and stop being a Canadian resident. Uh, my assumption is most based on that the only connection with Canada right now, it would be the wife's employer. Um, so with that assumption, their yeah, worldwide income would be subject to U.S. taxation. So specifically for the wife, she could work in the U.S. for the Canadian employer, but any income earned from that Canadian employer would be subject to U.S. tax. Uh, what happened is the Canadian employer likely doesn't know it or could not withhold tax and remit it to IRS. So they would continue, either continue with mid, um, withhold and remit tax to CRA. So what happened is the wife would have to file a tax return saying that she's no longer a Canadian resident and none of the income on the T4 um, is actually Can Canadian source income and should not be subject to Canadian tax. And then by filing that tax return, he, she would receive or expect to receive all the tax withheld as a tax refund. And then on the other hand, she would have to pay tax to the IRS. So likely she would have to pay tax to IRS and waiting for a tax refund from a CRA. Uh, it's actually one of the problem I mentioned under the US payroll tax is the cash flow problem. So ideally she should notify his her Canadian employer about her tax residency status and try to apply for a reduction of foreign tax, uh, sorry, a reduction of income tax to be withheld from her employment income. So the employer would not withhold any tax on it. And then she could, on the other hand, use some of those extra paychecks she received from the employer and start paying US tax. So by the time she filed US tax return, She's not expecting a, a large amount of payable. Thank you, Philip. Um, so at the end of the presentation, you, you were talking about treaty disclosure reporting. So the question is, how do you file a treaty disclosure and how often do you need to do that? So a treaty disclosure is disclosed on a form called form IRS form 8833. The form is filed with a tax return. Uh, presumably, uh, if you are non-resident and you're filing a 1040 NR return, you would just attach that treaty disclosure with the tax return, stating the reasoning and then the paragraph you're referring uh, to claim the treaty benefit. Uh, the treaty disclosure has to be filed on an annual basis. So any year that you're relying on the treaty uh, to exclude a certain income or remain as a non-resident of the U.S., you would have to file it on an annual basis along with the, the tax return. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions, even though uh, we, we might have to reach out some, some uh, audience for uh, follow-up after the webinar. So the next question will be um, remote work. So uh, during the pandemic, lots of people uh, do the remote work. So what is the impact 
of remote work, working from either countries. I assume it would be the US and Canada. So working from either the US or Canada for clients or projects in either the US and Canada. What's the impact of the remote work? So it goes back to the sourcing of the income. So employment income is sourced based on the location where you perform the service. So if you're working remotely from your home in a location, the employment income is attributed to that location. So if you are working in the US for a Canadian employer, you are actually earning US source income. Then we would have to go back to that treaty or the, the tax residency to make the determination to figure out uh, your filing obligation and to determine whether your US source income could be excluded under the income tax treaty. Um, and also things to consider is depending on the service you're providing when you're working remotely, you might actually creating some unexpected result for your employer. Like for example, if you are uh, staying on a phone, concluding contracts, maybe uh, with client while you are uh, working from your vacation home in the US, you might already creating a permanent establishment for your Canadian employer. So a lot of the facts could change the conclusion. Um, but but the, the rule of thumb is, any employment income is sourced to the location where you perform the service. So the, the, the currency doesn't matter, the location of the employer doesn't matter, it's where you are, it matters. Thank you. The last question will be, um, what is the situation if I am a dual citizen living in the US, have income from both the US and Canada, uh, I work remotely from the US with an occasional in-person meeting in Canada. How is the residency to be decided? Yeah, so, so the residency, again, go back to the domestic law, right? In this case, because he's a US citizen, he would automatically be a US resident. Uh, he only traveled to Canada occasionally. So presumably he doesn't have enough tie to, be, to establish Canadian residency. If he does, he's likely gonna tie break back to the US based on either permanent home or habitual or center of vital interest. So we, we would assume that he's gonna be a US resident and a Canadian non-resident. Uh, the fact that he's earning income from both Canada and US, uh, we would have to, to, to do an analysis on the sourcing of the income depending on the location where he provides a service. So for those business trips that he's doing, he's visiting Canada, those, the income attributed to those days that physically in Canada would be Canadian source income. Again, um, today's topic, we're mostly focusing on US taxation on US source income, but the treaty actually goes both way. So in case a US resident earning Canadian source income, they could be still be excluded under the Canadian taxation. We just have to review the paragraph of the, uh, the article and the paragraph of the treaty to see whether it meets the criteria, um, whether, to, whether the income is less than $10,000 or that he's spending less than 183 days and then it's not tied to a Canadian permanent establishment. Uh, if we, we decided that the income, the Canadian source income could be excluded from Canadian taxation, um, then, you could notify CRA and then, and then get the, any tax withheld back. Uh, one difference between Canada and US is for Canadian individual, it's not required to disclose the treaty uh, benefit. So you just rely on it and just get the, the, the tax refund, but you are not required to file a return for it. Um, but if the Canadian source income is taxable in Canada, then you would file a Canadian non-resident return and just report whatever the, the Canadian source income and pay tax on it. Thank you, Philip, for answering all the questions. Um, this is the last question we can answer within the time limit, but we will follow up with the audience with the questions that are not answered by now. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for attending our webinar today and also stay tuned. We have a um, regular webinar coming up in the future. Uh, again, thank you for your time today and um, have a good day. Thank you.